Alright, I guess it's recording. Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, uh, there's Jesus is on, a, I guess, more or less a, a circuit uh, where he's going about preaching and teaching the gospel. And that's what it starts. That's how chapter 8 starts out. It says, And it came to pass afterward that he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. The, um, I'm going to mention the last thing first, uh, and that was the, the, the women that were ministering to him, uh, and it says that of their substance. I don't suspect that any of these were like super wealthy or anything like that, but what's uh, telling is that, you know, when Jesus was cornered about paying taxes, he had to ask for a penny. Uh, he had to ask for a coin, somebody to show a coin, because he didn't have one. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't keep wealth, uh, the, and, you know, and he didn't... Uh, uh, at least at one point, he said he didn't have a place to even lay his head. Uh, at least like you know, normal folk would. Uh, uh, he didn't have a house. He didn't have uh, land. He didn't have all of those things. And the notion that Jesus was somehow a wealthy individual and that if you follow Jesus that you'll be wealthy and rich is a completely false uh, notion and a false idea. And it certainly doesn't come from Scripture. But uh, Jesus taught his disciples to do as he's doing as well and that was to live off of what you know people would supply him with and uh, that's what they were doing and here's the thing uh, these are people that Jesus had helped tremendously and it was it's quite a natural response uh, that when Jesus delivers you uh, from this Mary Magdalene had seven devils I don't even know what that was like but it had to be a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, amount of, of uh, gratitude that was coming from her, uh, that she wanted to serve and she wanted to help him. Uh, and, and that's just simply the way things ought to work. Uh, you know, Jesus delivers you from your sin and then you use that liberty and you use that grace that you received to serve Jesus. That's the way these women were doing it. That's really what's to be expected of any of us. Um, also, the fact that he went, it says, preaching and showing the gospel. Well, how do you show the gospel? I know what you preach. It says glad tidings. That's what the, that's what the gospel means. It means glad tidings. It means good news. Um, so, but how do you show it? You preach it and you show it. Um, so Jesus was going around. He wasn't just telling the good news of the gospel. He was also demonstrating it. He was demonstrating it through the miraculous power uh, through that, that, that he had, uh, through his actions, through his deeds. He was showing people that the gospel that he preached, the gospel that he was presenting, was the real deal. And it, there wasn't anything fake or phony about it. Uh, and that's... One of the things like, you know, you might, uh, you might think that, well, I don't have that to authenticate the gospel. How do I show the gospel? How do I preach and show the gospel? Uh, Jesus didn't just show through miraculous means. Jesus showed the gospel in how he treated other people. You know, nobody could ever accuse Jesus of uh, being unkind, uh, ungracious, mean-spirited, uh, uh, short-tempered. Nobody could ever accuse him of those things. Uh, he showed the gospel by his behavior and by his treatment of others. Now, we don't have the uh, power to raise the dead 
and to uh, uh, make the lame walk and to uh, make the blind see and so forth to authenticate what we're saying. But Jesus did that. He already did that. And we have that here. We have it recorded. So, but, but while we tell the gospel, while we share the gospel, that's, it's also necessary for us to show it. And that's how we show it and how our behavior is, what our manner of life is. Uh, how do we treat other people? How, how do we, uh, if someone's observing your life, what is it that, that stands out as being important to you? Uh, those sorts of things. And uh, Jesus uh, was, was doing this in addition to the miracles and so forth. But we don't need to get hung up on the miracles that Jesus was doing and say, well, I don't, I don't, have, as, uh, I, I don't, I don't have as good of a... A platform as he had because I don't have the ability to do this. Yes, you do too. Uh, you have what Jesus did in your life, the same as these women had. Uh, these women didn't have the ability to uh, raise the dead and heal the sick and, and, and cause the blind to see and so forth, but they had their testimony. They had, let me tell you about what Jesus did for me. And people could see it in their life. They could see whatever change that took, her, that, uh, took place in their life. They could see that. That's showing the gospel. So preaching the gospel and showing the gospel uh, is what is um, effective. And now in uh, verse 4, he introduces a parable. And uh, a parable, by the way, it's my understanding, it literally means alongside. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a thing, it's a, it's a story, or it could even be, you know, some... Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily a story, but uh, it's things that we're familiar with that d demonstrate or illustrate a truth that we may not be familiar with. And, and it's, it's alongside that. It's a, we, the, the thing that's familiar to us is taught alongside of this truth that we might not be aware of. And that's basically what a parable is. Um, it says, And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And by the way, I, I, this is called the parable of the sower. Uh, why we know it's called that is because in Matthew, that's what Jesus called it, the parable of the sower. Uh, and uh, I initially uh, was going to, I had written out the parable of the sower and the seed because in my mind, that's, that's what it was about. And uh, technically, you could also call it the parable of the soil because that's also involved. Uh, but none of those names, whenever I discovered that, wait a minute, Jesus gave this parable a name. I don't have any right to go changing it. So that's the reason why it's called the parable of the sower. And my mind is because that's the name that Jesus gave it. And uh, although there's other aspects to it, uh, but he says, a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And now the wayside might be, like if you have an area, a plot that you're getting ready to plant on, uh, the wayside would be the path that people traveled, because you had to get through the fields to tend to your, to your crops, and you had to get through there to plant them. So you, you, you would have you know, areas where you would walk. Well, as he's sowing it, some of the seeds fall in on those areas. And those areas tend to be packed and hard so that they can hold you up as you're walking through there. And it just it happens to be the way nature works. Whenever you have a path, it tends to be packed. Um, uh, and some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, uh, let him hear. That's a phrase that we've heard on many times in the New Testament. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Remember whenever Jesus uh, spoke uh, to give, instruct John to write letters and give to the seven churches of Asia Minor, uh, he ended each one with, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I, 
I don't claim to have the market cornered on that on the meaning of that phrase, but uh, in my mind, uh, what I suspect that it means is if if you if you capable of hearing this, it's meant for you. It's meant for whoever hears it. That's what that means. So is it? Does it apply to you? Yes, it applies to you. Uh, did it apply to the disciples back then, 2,000 years ago? Yes, but not them exclusively because we have ears and, and, and uh, we hear the message too. Uh, and uh, that's what that means. The reason why is because so many times people don't hear and they don't want to hear uh, what the Lord says. And uh, for that reason... Uh, he doesn't have any desire to speak to those people. He wants to speak to the people that want to hear. And uh, so he gave this parable. The scripture's not clear on what else happened. It gives the impression that he didn't do much else other than speak this parable. So you can imagine the people might be scratching their heads. The disciples certainly were. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it begs the question, you know, why did Jesus speak in parables in this way? And he answers that whenever his uh, disciples uh, uh, asked, uh, what, what is this about? And it says in verse 9, And his disciples asked him, saying, What might this parable be? Now, when it says disciples, it's talking about those that were close to him, the, the, the twelve. Uh, and uh, he says, Unto you... It is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. So they wanted to know the meaning, and then they, the, Jesus tells them, I'm going to tell you the meaning because I want you to know. But to the rest, this is why I speak in parables. Some people, I, I remember in Sunday school one time, a long time ago, somebody was telling me, well, Jesus spoke in parables and gave these illustrations to help explain things. Well, that's not what Jesus said. Now, matter of fact, he says it in, in, in uh, more um, uh, elaborate terms than this, uh, to, just to say the opposite, that he didn't want certain people to understand. And here's the truth, that if you hear something from the Lord, and you don't quite understand it, and you want to know the answer, you're going to look for it. You're going to, you're going to seek it. And what did Jesus say about that? He said, seek and you shall find. He didn't say you might find it if you're lucky. He said, seek and ye shall find. And he says, knock and it shall be opened unto you. This is not something that uh, that's, uh, uh, depends upon the weather. This is something that is uh, firm and sure and true. If, you're, if there is something that you need to know, if there's something that, that you don't understand, you can seek it. And Jesus says, it won't be in vain. When you seek the answer, you're going to find the answer that you need. Uh, when you knock on a closed door, it's going to be opened and you'll, you'll be, it'll be opened unto you. Um, the... Uh, so it, it, that's the, but, but there's people there that are not interested in, in knowing. He doesn't want them people to hear what he's saying. And, there's, and the reason why, he says it's, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. That hearing, that they, they hear the same message that everybody else did, but they rejected it. Now, it wasn't revealed to them, not because Jesus didn't explain it well enough. It wasn't revealed to them because they didn't want to know. They truly didn't want to know the truth. Uh, what they were looking for back then, uh, so many others are looking for even to this day. They're looking for someone to confirm what it is they heart desires, what it is that they want. They want someone to tell them that they're right. They want someone to tell them that they're good. They want someone to tell them that there's nothing wrong with them, that you're fine just the way that you are, and they don't want anyone to change their, their life or the way that they see things. They don't want it. That's the way many people are. The, the Pharisees in that day was just like that. People to this very day are the same way. Uh, they, sometimes people will come to Jesus uh, out of curiosity and want to see what he says, but they're not serious about it. They don't really want to know uh, what it is that he's telling them. They, don't really, they want something to, someone that's going to confirm them 
in their sin and in their disobedience. And Jesus isn't going to do that. And so he speaks to them in parables, but he's going to explain to his disciples because his disciples did what? They asked. They said, Lord, can you explain this? And he said, sure. So that's what happens when someone that wants to know uh, asks and it's, it, it's, it's given. Uh, and the same goes for any of us. There's things in the scripture that many things that we might stumble over, many things we might not understand. Uh, it doesn't even have to be a parable. Uh, but if you have you asked, have you asked the Lord? Uh, and if you don't receive the answer right away, it's not on account of he don't, he's not true to his word. It, it, you have to believe that he's going to honor his, his word. And that uh, if you look for the answer, you're going to find it. You might not find the answer you're looking for, but you're going to find the, the right one if you're, if you're sincerely uh, with a pure heart seeking it out. That's why Jesus spoke in parables. It's because he wanted to keep concealed the, 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 the deep truths of God from those that had no interest, but he wanted to expose the people that did have an interest. He wanted to expose them to the truth, and this is the way that he could do both uh, in, one, in one shot. Now, uh, they ask him to explain it. He says he will. And he says in verse 11, Now the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. That's at the front of the whole affair. Is understanding what the seed is. Because a lot of people, even today, even knowing the Scripture, have confusion on this parable. Because they'll, they'll look to it and they'll say, well, this parable here shows that people can be saved and then lose their salvation. Because the, you know, they end up getting choked out or they end up uh, not getting water or you know, when you use the analogy. Uh, but he doesn't say that the seed is salvation. And that's where uh, you know, people really make a mistake is they equate the seed to someone actually being saved. And that's not what it is. The seed is the Word of God. And if you don't get that right at the very onset, you're going to confuse and misunderstand the whole thing. It's the seed is the Word of God. He says, Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now these are those that are hardened like that pathway that have a hard heart and the word just doesn't penetrate it and it doesn't have any place to take root because it's on the path where people walk and where people tread and, and the birds eat the seed and that's the devil that, that robs uh, that message from them. Now, with, I also need to say this, that the word of God is, the, uh, is at the front here. And we don't need to lose sight of what it says he was doing at the very beginning. He was preaching and showing the gospel. And that's the word of God. So this, this whole chapter actually is centered around that idea. And, and it tells us how faith is obtained. And we, uh, 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 we see that, that, you know, in Paul in the uh, New Testament in Romans chapter 10 tells us that faith comes from hearing the Word of God. And that's the reason why, at least one of the reasons why, that the Word of God is so important. It must not be diminished uh, in our hearts and minds. The, uh, a church that doesn't preach and teach the Word of God is not worth much. Because they, 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 they don't have... Um, uh, they don't have the, uh, they're, they're not preaching and teaching with authority. And they're not delivering the message that God wants delivered. They're not, even, they're not even sowing the seed. If you're not preaching the Word of God, remember that's the seed. If you're not doing that, then you're not sowing the seed. And the seed is what needs to be sown. It's also a, 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 a very important that we do not convolute the message. Uh, and the gospel message is the most important thing in all of this world. And there are many that have altered it. There are many that have changed it in one way or another. Uh, and uh, various different groups that claim to be Christian 
And I think uh, uh, one of the more dangerous uh, of, of the cults would be Mormonism. Uh, because they don't mind, they don't even try to hide it. It's right on their book, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. Now, when we understand testaments and we understand what Hebrew says about testaments, about the, 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 uh, the, the, the new one supersedes the old, uh, that you don't keep the old one in force when the new one comes along. Uh, we also understand that Paul, it says, was the apostle to the Gentiles, what are we over here on this continent? Uh, uh, the people that were here before the Europeans came, what were they? Uh, all of us are Gentiles. Gentiles means not Jews. And, and uh, so Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And uh, for that reason, we should pay very close attention to what he says. And what he said is this uh, to the Galatians. He said that uh, uh, if any man... Even I'm going to paraphrase it, but he said, if any man comes to you preaching another gospel, whether it be an angel or whether it be another man or somebody that says he comes from him, whoever it is, let them be accursed. And then he repeats it. He says the same thing again. If any man come to you with another gospel, be it man or angel, let them be accursed. Because there's only one gospel, and there's only one gospel that saves, there's only one gospel that's effective, and that's if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Now, a lot of people want to attach other things to that. Believe and be baptized, and go to church, and do good works, and uh, uh, never fall, and never falter, and never slip away, and all those things, and then you're okay. Well, that's not the gospel. Uh, what the Philippian jailer was told was believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And people also ask, well, where's repentance? You're supposed to repent. That is repentance. The repentance is the repentance from unbelief. You repent of being an unbeliever and you become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, uh, of course, that, that steps all over the toes of people that want to, uh, 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 that think it's their responsibility to make saints out of other people. Is it? Did the sower make that make that come up out of the ground? When you plant a garden, are you out there in the garden looking at that seed, massaging that seed, trying to make it come up out of that dirt? You don't do any of that. You sow the seed, and that's it. God is the one that does a work in the heart of an individual. And if an individual that comes to Christ does not see that sin is the problem, it doesn't see that sin is destructive. They don't have any reason to come to Christ. They don't have any reason to believe in Him. The gospel message is meant for people that see their sin and the wickedness of their sin and the destructiveness of their sin and they want to be rescued from it. So you don't have to tell somebody like that, oh, also you need to repent. Well, no joke. That Believing in Jesus Christ is repentance because you're repenting from unbelief and you're becoming a believer. And, and uh, anything added to that is a danger. And uh, the, uh, uh, so the gospel message is, is important. And we don't need to convolute it and, say, you know, and, and introduce other things and new ideas. And uh, it's, it's very uh, effective uh, the way that God made it. Just like the seed is effective the way God made it. We don't need to alter it. We don't need to make it better. Matter of fact, the seeds that we alter are not nearly as good as the ones God made. Um, uh, I, I do uh, remember some time ago that uh, we were throwing some waste out in the yard uh, near a stump, and some of it was tomato waste, and the tomatoes came from Walmart. And uh, I kid you not, we, we, uh, a volunteer grew up out of all that waste, and we let it grow, and we staked it and uh, uh, just to see what would happen, see what it would do. That thing produced tomatoes. I counted them one time, and I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. There was 70 tomatoes on that one plant, and they all tasted horrible, <laughs> just like the ones you buy in Walmart. But that's the reason they alter those seeds so that they they produce more, but they have less flavor. And and, and uh, so whenever you don't need to. Uh, uh, you don't need to alter the seed in any way. And it's like you don't need to uh, alter the gospel in any way. It's best just the way it is and just the way it's, it was delivered. Now, um, 
he goes on to say that uh, uh, they, they on the rock are they which, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and those have no root for a while believe, and a time of temptation fall away. Now, what that tells us is not everybody that makes a profession has sincerely opened their heart to Jesus. Uh, that sometimes it's just an empty profession. And that it doesn't go any deeper than that. A profession, and that's it. It's not heartfelt. It's not meant. And so whenever things, uh, uh, they don't have any root. Uh, so uh, for a while, when, uh, when temptation comes, when trials come, they abandon the whole idea because it didn't mean anything to them to begin with. In verse 14, it says, And that which fell among the thorns are they which when they heard go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. So th these are those that, that, the, that the cares and the pleasures of this life are more important to them than, than faith in Christ. And there's a good many people that are like that. That's the reason why so many people change the message to try to appeal to those people that are motivated by pleasures of this world. And that's the reason why there's so many churches that are so worldly is because they want to appeal to people that find pleasure uh, in those things in hopes to change them. And again, it's all about that seed. But on the good ground are they which an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit uh, with patience. The, uh, uh, he says something in these last three verses. I'm running out of time. I wanted to go a little bit further. Because the interesting thing is, this tells us how faith is obtained. You hear that good news being preached. And then you, you believe it. You accept it. You receive it. Not on the surface, but in your heart. You receive it. And it changes you. It does something to you so that it produces in you fruit. Now, the, the, the Bible tells us uh, in, in, in uh, the epistle that James wrote that, that faith without works is dead. And that's because that's what faith does. Faith is like that seed. It produces a plant which produces fruit. If it doesn't do those things, it's a dead seed. It's dead in the ground. It's not doing anything. How I many of you ever planted a garden and planted seed and nothing happened? Uh, that I, I have, uh, especially when the seeds get old, they don't do as well. But um, not not to say that that's part of the analogy or anything, but that but that does happen. And uh, faith without works is like that dead seed; it just sits in the dirt and it doesn't do anything. Uh, but Jesus says that when a good seed falls in a good heart on good ground, uh, it brings forth fruit with patience. And then he says this, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on the candlestick, that they, that they which might enter may see the light. Now, you, you might think, well, where is he going with this lesson? It seems like a different lesson. No, he's talking about faith and one of the characteristics of faith. Uh, and what he's saying is uh, just what I've already said, that it produces something. And uh, the reason why you take a candle and put it on a, a stand so that it lights the room is because it produces something. It produces that light. It gives illumination and it helps us to be able to see. It has a purpose. Uh, and, and the faith is that way. If it's not that way, then it's, then it's pointless and useless. He goes on to say, For nothing is secret, and that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be made known and come abroad. I'm actually on the next page here, I think. Yeah, I am. But I'm not going to be able to finish all these. But, but uh, uh, nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be made known and come abroad. Now, when you first read that and think of that, you might be thinking of Judgment Day. You know, when my heart's going to be revealed, it's going to be revealed before all, all my deep, darkest secrets, everybody's going to know. Well, I better be careful of what things that I do because I don't want, I don't want to look like a horrible person, uh, you know, and it's all revealed. Jesus isn't talking about judgment here in that respect. 
He's, he's not jumping to a different subject. He's still talking about the same thing. And, and what this tells us is, is that true faith is going to reveal itself. Whatever is in your heart is going to come out and show other people. You can only put up a facade for so long. And what lies beneath is going to work to the surface eventually. And, and all the world will see. Uh, so if true faith reveals itself or uh, uh, disbelief also will re reveal itself when, when the uh, faith is not genuine. Um, but um, this is what he's going, speaking about here. Uh, there's nothing secret that shall not be made manifest. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the thoughts and, 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 and the deeds of your heart are going to eventually make it out to where other people can see. And, and uh, uh, he goes on to say, uh, Neither anything hid that shall not be made known and come abroad. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given. And whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken even that which he seemeth to have. Now what in the world is all that about? It would seem like he's jumping across different subjects. But it's not. It's the same subject. And uh, uh, it's, it speaks about the use of this, this parable even. And he uh, said this on more than one occasion. And to, to he that, that, that has, to, uh, to him shall be given. What is he talking about? Well, he begins it by saying to take heed how you hear things. And if you have, you're going to be given more uh, if you have what if you have a genuine desire to, to, to know if you have a genuine desire to seek after God and to seek after his revelation if you have a genuine desire in your heart to know him better and to not come to Him with reservation and not come to Him with, a, with the notion that you're going to make a deal with Him and that you'll do this if He'll do that. Uh, it's, it's not, but if you have a genuine desire to know God, He's going to increase that. And He's going to give you uh, what you desire. If, if you don't, what you think that you have, what you think you possess... Uh, is going to be taken away from you. Uh, and these, th this is a very broad saying, and it has, a, excuse me, it has a very broad application, uh, and it can cover a, a great many things. Uh, if, you, if, you have some, if, if you have the fruit, for example, of faith, if you have the, the, uh, uh, the works that, that accompany faith, uh, that is going to grow. That is going to increase. But if you don't have the, the, the desire to hear and to be receptive to what God says, the qualities that you think you have, the traits that you think you have, the goodness that you think you have that you possess is going to diminish and go away. That's what he's talking about. But like I said, there's more than one application to that, so I don't mean to suggest that that's the only one. But, but uh uh, to, to, to those that, that truly and sincerely want to know God, they can. And that's that, but those that, that, uh, uh, that think that they are something, they're going to lose that, what, they, what they do have. Um, we're going to have to go ahead and stop there because we're out of time. But um, I do want to mention this. This is how the first part of this chapter... He talks about how faith comes about and how it grows and how it produces and how it's made um, beneficial or, or, or productive in the life of an individual. And these next series of stories, I like the way Luke arranged this, but he did so, of course, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But I like the way it's arranged in that he establishes this is how you receive faith. You hear the word of God with a sincere heart and receive it. And, but faith just received, it doesn't never work that way. It doesn't just be that we know one day you wake up and all of a sudden you have faith in God and you're good to go. It's, it's got to be tested. 
And the reason it's got to be tested is because in order to benefit you, it needs to grow. And you might you can believe God now, but you need to have more belief. We all need to believe Him more. We all need to trust Him more. We need to know Him more. And the way that happens is through testing. And so our faith, the way it comes about is one thing, but the way it's tested is something else. And um, uh, we're going to look at this next week, Lord willing, but these next few verses has to do with uh, Jesus' mother and his brethren uh, wasn't able to reach him. And they sent word uh, uh, that they desired to see him. And Jesus' answer is that my mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Now that's pretty much the embodiment of all that he just taught here about the seed, about the word of God falling onto a soil that is receptive and that produces and multiplies. That's the person that hears the word of God and then does it. And you open up a whole, you, you literally open up a whole new life if you're, if, whenever you practice that. Whenever you say, when, I, when I'm making this decision because the word of God says for me to, says thus and thus, says you know, for me to do this the way that I'm doing it. And, and, and uh, uh, that's what faith is. I trust God. I trust what He says. I trust what God says above what anybody else says. I trust what God says above even my own eyes. That's the attitude that we need to have. Uh, I trust God above my own, my own vision, my own sight. Uh, I don't care the way same things seem. I'm going to go with what God's Word says. And that's the people that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that belong to him. Those are the people that are his. Those are the people that Jesus associates with. It's the people that hear his word and do it. So that we're not just hearers of the word, that we're also doers of it. And uh, how important that is. How important that is to be, a, to be delivered. When you think of what the things that Jesus says to do, uh, the, the primary thing is to trust him. Isn't it a good thing that we have someone that we can trust to take care of us, to, to, to handle our problems for us, to bear our burdens for us? That's a good thing, a wonderful thing. And that's the main thing that he wants us to do is to trust him. But well, why are we so reluctant? Even people that know him, even people that should know better, like myself, uh, sometimes it's a stumbling block to just trust in the Lord Jesus and to trust that the outcome is going to, it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine uh, because he said so. and He told me to trust him. Uh, and uh, so that's when it comes to doing the word, uh, a large part of it is just that. Trusting that Jesus is going to do what he says he'll do and our actions reflect that. And, and, and that's what's revealed in our heart when we do trust him. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this time together. We thank you, Lord, for the testimony of uh, your servant, Luke. And thank you, Lord, for recording this parable in the way that you have so that we might learn from it today. And help us, O oh Lord, to have ears to hear it. Help us, O oh Lord, to know the meaning thereof and help us to know uh, how it's applied uh, to us all these years later. Because we know it, it, it does. And uh, Lord, I thank you for the promises in your word. I thank you for the Lord Jesus who bears our burdens, who, who takes our sin from us. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to elevate him in our lives and our daily walk, that we might not be just hearers of the word, but that we might be doers and that we might be your witnesses, not just sharing the gospel, but also showing it. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.